Hey folks, it's Andrew here and welcome to MIDI part 5. Uh, this part we're going to talk about channel messages, uh, which are probably the most common types of messages in MIDI. They're the ones when you play your keyboard or turn a knob or use the pitch bend wheel. Those are all channel messages. So let's just have a look at the topics and then we'll get right into it. So basically channel messages are all the things that are performance oriented things that you're going to control from your keyboard or your MIDI controller and so on. Note ons and offs, control changes, pitch bend, after touch and which is called pressure and then the program change messages. So let's just go through each of those and uh, have a look at how they work. So for this video, I've actually made uh, my own sort of chart uh, showing the various messages and sort of breaking them down because I found in the MIDI spec, these are sort of described in paragraphs sometimes, but there's no real sort of definitive list or table like this. So I kind of just went through and put down all the information here. And so hopefully this makes it a little bit more easy uh, to uh, understand. So basically the first ones and probably the most common MIDI messages that we know of are just note on and off. Pretty much any keyboard that has MIDI, if it's only going to support one kind of MIDI message, it's basically going to be note messages. Most have other functions as well, but these are the, the most common types. So there's note off and then there's note on and they sort of work in the same way. And there's a sort of special thing about how they work. Uh, where, especially with the note on, um, and we'll get into that in a sec, but basically they both work the same way where they both have three bytes. A uh, note off starts with an eight, and then the channel is the lower four bits. Zero through F is channel one through 16. And the note number is zero to 127, so there's 128 actual notes. These are the keys on the keyboard, and these can range in value from something much lower than the piano all the way up to higher than the piano because of course there's only 88 keys on the piano. Um, and the note number 60 is middle C, uh, 60 in decimal. Uh, and then all the notes kind of range up and down from there. So MIDI is really designed for sort of Western scales equal tempered tunings. That's really kind of how it was envisioned. Uh, there is no way in MIDI to send just like a frequency or microtonal scales or anything like that. So that if you're using an instrument that supports that, basically the note numbers are sort of thought of in terms of, of equal tempered piano style notes. Um, you can obviously convert that into meaning other things, but when we talk about notes and when we say, well, this note number equals this note on the actual instrument, that's really thought of in a sort of, uh, in a sort of Western style. Um, note off, well, okay, let's talk about note on first. Note on basically has the note number, and then it has a velocity, and velocity is how hard you hit the key on your keyboard. Velocity of zero has a special meaning. It means actually note off, because zero <clears throat> is like no velocity. That doesn't make any sense. So, and in fact, because we talked about running status in the previous episode, because of running status and the fact that it affords us this form of compression, um, note on is often used as the only note message and note off is just ignored because if you're sending note ons and you can send note ons and offs using the same status byte, then you never have to clear the running status. And that means that you can play big rolling chords and you can have running status activated all the time because let's say you're only using one kind of status byte when one channel is, is in use on your keyboard. You can just send nine and then the channel number, let's say it would be nine zero, this would be channel one note on. Um, and that is a good thing. Uh, and there's another reason too, uh, is because release velocity would be sort of like how fast I'm letting go of the note. And although that seems like a good idea, note off supports release velocity. And I guess we could sort of detect how fast we're letting off the key. But most instruments don't really do anything with that. Uh, velocity on note ons is often used to determine how loud the note will play. But different release velocities are not that commonly implemented as far as I know. 
Um, so uh, often in software, what will happen is if you get a note on with a velocity of zero, the software library will rewrite that as a note off. And that actually is a common thing, and it's a good idea actually, if you're writing software that deals with MIDI, Sometimes it's just more convenient to be able to differentiate between note on and off just by looking at the status byte and not having to actually look at the velocity. So yeah, both of these basically work the same way. They have the note number, and then they have either an on or an off velocity. Uh, but definitely, this is the more common one. Uh, control change messages. These are the ones like uh, knobs, um, the modulation wheel, the damper pedal on a keyboard that has a, a pedal for holding notes. Uh, what else? The volume slider or a volume knob on a lot of keyboards. Uh, they send control change messages. And those basically are for sending some sort of a value between one value and another value, so max to min. Um, the numbers, the value doesn't actually correspond to anything in particular. It's really dependent upon the product or the function. Um, but basically, normally, it's between 0 being like the very lowest thing to 127 being the highest thing. And that gives you 7 bits, which is 128 possible combinations uh, of possible values. Other kinds of things, like buttons, uh, usually use control change as well. Uh, those uh, use usually 0 means that it, you've let go and 127 means you've, you've pressed it down. Um, and within the controller, the first data byte means the controller number. There's 128 controllers. Uh, there's a special way called NRPN uh, to send special kinds of data that have higher resolution than just 128 bits. And these use special controllers, which are sort of in pairs, but let's not get into that right now. Basically, the idea is we've got B and then a channel number, all, all one of 16 channels. We've got our controller. Let's just say that's 128 possible controllers. These could be knobs, sliders, or various kinds of mode buttons and things. And then we've got a value that can be between 0 and 127. So that can give you a continuously smooth-ish kind of control. Um, one thing about control change that's interesting is that uh, there's no spec that says how fast you have to send these. So if you're turning your knob and it's generating a lot of data, let's say, inside the keyboard, um, it might not send all that data out the MIDI uh, port because it, it, it would otherwise saturate the connection and maybe other messages wouldn't be able to be sent. So there is some sort of, you know, you have to sort of test each product to see how, what's the resolution in terms of time when you're actually turning a knob, how fast does it actually send updates. Um, and that is also true on the receiving side. If you have, let's say, a filter that you want to really smoothly sweep up and down as you turn the knob, you have to assume that the data that you're getting in might be quite coarse. You might you not get a, a nice smooth curve like that. You might instead get, you know, some points on a line like this and you know it's the responsibility of the receiver to kind of figure out if the, if it wants to smooth these out or in any way so that the values don't jump you don't get sort of a a, a zippery effect um, there are smoother as i said nrpn lets you do things in pairs of numbers some of the registered parameters like the volume not volume but there's a few others that that also allow you to send smoother data these let you send basically two controllers essentially that gives you two sets of seven bit data that gives you 14 bits of resolution if you want to have smoother operation um, but that's not necessarily um, the best thing it requires twice as many messages, and it does have incompatibilities with other kinds of products. Some things are just expecting a single controller. Um, so don't count on just being able to use that in, uh, between every product and every other product. Um, then we've got Pitch Bend. Pitch Bend doesn't, it sort of works like a controller, except it's its own message. So it gets E and then the channel number. And unlike the controller where we have seven bits for the controller number and then seven more bits for the actual value. In this case, pitch bend, because it really needs to be high resolution, 
Pitchpen gets its own entire message so that it uses both data bytes together to give you 14 bits of resolution because let's say you're bending over several semitones, the resolution of the, of the bender has to be much more than seven bits, otherwise you'd hear a lot of steps in between. Um, so normally these are added together. This is the least significant byte and the most significant byte, and these are basically shifted and ORed together. It gives you a range, instead of between 0 and 127, you get a range between 0 and 13, or 16, 383, sorry. And that's a positive number only, but then you just have to know that you subtract 8192, and then that gives you a, a, a number that ranges above and below 0. And when you leave the bender in the center position, essentially the 0 value, which is encoded this way, as 4000, means that it's in the center position. And I'm sure some of you have noticed when you use the pitch bender, when you just move it a little bit off center, it doesn't really take effect right away. And in most keyboards, that's an intentional thing because if the bender didn't come back perfectly to rest every time or the spring was a little bit loose or something like that, then you wouldn't want it to be playing all out of tune when, when you think that the bender has been let go. So normally when you implement a keyboard controller, you'll have sort of a, a dead zone in the middle like this where you would say, oh, okay, this is going to bend down and this is going to bend up, but in the center section here, we're not going to do anything. We're just going to send out the, the, the zero no bend value. And that's basically how that works. And then we have the two kinds of aftertouch, which are called pressure. We've got poly pressure and channel pressure. Um, they, they vary a little bit in that they both send a pressure value from sort of not pressing to pressing really hard. So, you know, on a synthesizer, when you've got sort of a spongy type of keyboard, you can play a chord or play a note, and then when you, when you sort of lean into the keyboard, it will usually cause some sort of an effect like a filter opening or vibrato starts or something crazy happens. And that's done with aftertouch or pressure. Um, and the two kinds of pressure are basically poly pressure, which is not really implemented very much in very many keyboards, where each note can send its own pressure value. So you could sort of press down and then only cause, like, say, your thumb to do something crazy. And the, the synthesizer on the receiving side would hopefully know how to make just that note do something and not the others. Um, that's pretty specific. Not too many keyboards support that. Um, and then there's sort of channel pressure, which is kind of more global, where basically it's implemented instead of each key having some sort of a sensor, instead they have just a sensor along the whole keyboard, and usually that's implemented with sort of a, a touch-sensitive, like a pressure-sensitive resistive strip uh, that's mounted underneath the keyboard. So no matter what key you press, they all kind of contribute to pressing down and, and changing the resistance of this strip. So it doesn't really matter which key you lean on, all of them will uh, send the same message basically. And that only has two data bytes where it's just D for, the, for channel pressure plus a pressure value from 0 to 127. And um, then we have program change, and this is the last kind of channel message. This is when you want to change a preset on a synth. You send a, a program change message, and this only has two bytes. It's the C and then the channel number, and then it sends a program change, uh, program number from one, uh, 0 to 127. And that's basically the reason why mostly on a synthesizer you'll see groups of programs in, in banks of 128. And in fact, there's a special way, it uses a control change actually, which we talked about over here, there's a special way to switch between different banks so that we can actually have more than just 128 presets or programs on our synth. Uh, but generally, once you're inside a bank, let's say it's the, you know, the user bank or the preset bank or whatever, generally, this is how you would switch between those individual programs. Um, Roland sort of does things differently, on, especially on older keyboards where they have two rows of eight buttons, and those don't those don't select uh, all 128, you can only actually select 64, and it's just because they have this interesting numbering where you go 1, 1, 1, 2, etc., like that. Um, 
that's a sort of a weird way. They, it's kind of like a half of a bank that you can access, and usually there's a button to toggle between a higher and lower sections. But that's not really the way MIDI works. MIDI is really designed to access all 128 in one sort of one shot. So it really depends on the user interface on the keyboard how that works. So that's channel messages. Uh, I hope that you found that interesting and uh, hope that it maybe explains some of the things behind the scenes that you probably use all the time with your synthesizers and MIDI instruments. And uh, in the next uh, episode, we're going to talk about MIDI clock. Uh, MIDI clock is sort of the frustrating and awesome thing that lets us synchronize devices together. So I hope you'll join me then. See ya.